Dark times have come to the empire of mankind. An impenetrable fog of uncertainty has shrouded the future of the entire human race. Deeper and deeper it plunged into the abyss of suffering and the bloodshed of civil war. At that time it was challenging to find a peaceful place on the galaxy's map. The young state known as the Imperium Secundus was no exception. With every victory of Horus, the light of hope became dimmer. Yet despite everything like tiny sparks, reflections of the stars in the night sky, or a candle's flame flickering in the wind, hope continued to smolder in people's hearts. Some hid it deep within their souls, concealing it from prying eyes. Others displayed it openly under the sunlight of hundreds of worlds where the battles of the heresy unfolded. For some, hope was based on something spiritual, like the will and courage of the Eisenstein's crew, while for others it took on material forms. Among these were the inhabitants of Ultramar, within whose borders the young state of Imperium Secundus then existed. The hopes for a bright future for billions of people were embodied by an ancient artifact named the Pharos Beacon. It was this mysterious light that marked not only the path to Makrag, but also to the souls of the people living in its light. Indeed, it was thanks to it that five hundred worlds, torn apart by a ruin storm, could reunite. Therefore, if the capital world was considered the brain of Imperium Secundus, then Sotha was its heart. Thanks to the beacon's operation on this planet, ships moved between the worlds of Ultramar like blood through vessels, and as long as it operated, life in the new state could continue. For this reason, billions of eyes peered into the sky to glimpse the single shining point against a blood-red sky. However, it attracted not only the gazes of friends, but also enemies. The first among them were the Night Lords, or more precisely, one of the many fragments of the once powerful legion that appeared after its defeat by Lionel Johnson. By that time, the Night Lords were no longer the formidable war machine that instilled primal fear in their enemies, not only with their appearance and tactics, but with their entire military might. This squad more closely resembled a warband, still maintaining its former hierarchy by inertia. Following the disappearance of Conrad Kurz, whose tracks were lost on McCrag, the only one who could have united all the disparate squads was Sevatar. But he was imprisoned by Johnson, making the Legion's disintegration seem more and more likely. Each of the captains was pulling the blanket over himself, tearing it to shreds. Lord Chiroptera Krukesh the Pale was trying to command one of these scraps. It must be said that he was rather mediocre at this. The commander's indecision and wavering were transmitted to their subordinates, which negatively affected discipline. Therefore, Krukesh's warriors obeyed him more because they simply did not yet know where else to turn. Realizing this, the Night Lord's captain decided that he could maintain his right to leadership only by achieving a significant victory. By that point, it was clear that in a direct confrontation with any of the Loyalist legions, his undisciplined forces were unlikely to prevail. Moreover, who could be surprised by a victory in a conventional battle at that time? Krukesh needed a significant target, one that was not too heavily defended. That's where the beacon on Sotha came in handy. Despite the importance of the object, it was guarded only by the 199th Ejida Company and a small detachment of Imperial Fists, who had arrived in Ultramar with Alexis Polux. Also present on the planet was the irregular 100th Auxiliary Force, which Krukesh did not even consider. After all, what could mere humans pose against the might of the Legionnaires? Even without understanding the full significance of the beacon, the Night Lords decided it would be the perfect target. This decision of the traitors would later prove the unsoundness of Johnson's opinion that a small garrison would attract less attention to the planet, thus saving it from invasion. The Lord Protector himself at that time was racing across the entire Imperium Secundus with manic persistence, trying to find any trace of Conrad Kurz, therefore being at the other end of his guarded state. The Sotha itself did not have a particularly strong defence except for the orbital station, which was the main base of the Ultramarines in that system. It was decided to station the main forces of the Aegida on orbit, due to the fact that prolonged proximity to the beacon started to plague the warriors with nightmares. Therefore it was decided to rotate the Astartes through fixed intervals. On the surface of the planet, 
There were hardly any fortifications suitable for defence. The world itself was agrarian and not heavily populated, resulting in the limited number of the Hundredth Auxiliary's force. The weaponry of the planet's mortal defenders also left much to be desired. Based on this information, which the Night Lords obtained through reconnaissance, the warriors of the Eighth Legion devised their cunning plan of attack. The operation to capture the Sotha began far from the planet itself. A patrol ship of the Ultramarines, commanded by Sergeant Legionary Lethicus, stumbled upon a heavily damaged vessel. After Auspex scanning, it was revealed that the dead ship was named Nicton and belonged to the Night Lords. Of course, few could be surprised by such remnants at that time, as the Civil War had scattered them generously across the galaxy. This ship would have been left to drift further in the cold void of space had Lethicus not been alerted by several suspicious aspects. The first and foremost fact was that its trajectory intersected with the orbit of Sotha, indicating that it would soon collide with the planet. The second factor, which also testified to the ship's non-random appearance here, was the battle in which, according to available information, it was destroyed by the Dark Angels. The vessel sustained critical damage in the Battle of Sagwalsa, which occurred in the Thramas sector. Without warp engines, the ship had virtually zero probability of being in this location, let alone having such a flight trajectory. Lethicus did not dare to leave the mysterious find alone. Therefore, he ordered the launch of all the torpedoes at his disposal to completely destroy the ghost ship. After the successful attack, the Legionnaire faced a tough choice, either accept it as a coincidence and continue patrolling, or head to the Vox station and report to Sotha about the possible threat of an enemy's imminent appearance in the system. However, the second option left a gap in the observation network through which the enemy could breach unnoticed. Weighing all the pros and cons, Lethicus decided to opt for the second choice and rushed at full speed to the station. By that time, a patrol ship's relay was already ambushed. Thirty-two Night Lords were hiding in the dimness of the station. They had spent two weeks in this voluntary confinement, and now their wait had come to an end. A ship was approaching the Vox station. Everything unfolded exactly as planned. The Ultramarines fell for the trick with the destroyed ship, and headed to the relay, where the warriors of the 45th Company, commanded by Gendor Skravok, known as the Painted Count, awaited them. After a brief battle, the ship was seized by the Night Lords. This allowed them to proceed to the next stage of their plan. In a very short time, the Night Lords' prize arrived at Sotha and connected with their orbital station. The message sent by Morality to the station reported that the vessel had suffered serious damage and had almost lost control. Therefore, the ship required urgent assistance, and for this, the crew requested permission to dock at the station. After some hesitation, the Ultramarines consented to the emergency docking. This decision became their fatal mistake, which predetermined the fate of all the station's inhabitants. A fierce battle ensued, the outcome of which would determine the battle for Sotha and both sides realized that if the station fell, nothing would stop the Ultramarines. With such a balance of power, the Space Marines of the 13th could have successfully defended themselves, but the enemy outsmarted them. It turned out that an enemy fleet was located on the opposite side of the station. The Night Lords took advantage of the fact that the beacon blinded the scanning device of the orbital station preventing the defenders from noticing the enemy's cunning maneuver. It was this maneuver that changed the course of the battle. Thanks to their overwhelming numerical superiority, Krukesh's forces quickly took control of the station, slaughtering its crew. No one from the station's crew survived, except for three scouts who had been sent to Sotha before the battle began on the order of Captain Adalus of the 199th Company. Simultaneously, in order not to waste time and to maintain the element of surprise, the Night Lords commenced a drop operation on the planet. Dozens of capsules cut through Sotha's sky with fiery trails, deploying warriors in dark blue armor. Without waiting to be detected, they began to advance from all sides towards Sothopolis. The first to notice the impending disaster on the surface 
were the soldiers of the Sotan Auxilia. However, few of them could imagine the horrors awaiting them in the coming days. Extinguishing their fires, they quickly headed towards the city. Despite their haste, the Auxilia soldiers did not arrive in time for the beginning of the battles for Sothopolis, and soon watched in horror and sadness as the city slowly fell. The only thing they could do to not feel completely helpless was to gather all the residents who had escaped by fleeing and take them to the caves of the mountain. It was also decided to scout the situation in the city. A small squad managed to penetrate to the central square through the sewage tunnels. What they saw there shook them to the core. The city square had been transformed by the Night Lords into a place of torture, where legionnaires satisfied their thirst for violence in any way possible. However, this did not break their spirit. As they returned, they, being mere humans, managed to rescue an ultramarine sergeant captured by two of the Eighth Legion warriors and then killed them both. But the joy from this small, albeit impressive, victory was short-lived. Everyone understood that only death lay ahead of them. At that time, Barabbas D'Antioch contacted Raboot Gilliman and reported the situation to him. The news enraged the Primarch. Without much deliberation, he already wanted to use the Beacon's capability to instantly transport himself to Sotha, but the Warsmith held him back from making a hasty decision. He argued that moving the Avenging Sun to the planet was too big and unjustified a risk. Even for the Iron Warrior himself, the principles of transportation via the Beacon remained a mystery, so he couldn't guarantee that he would be able to arrange the transfer of any significant forces of the 13th Legion to protect the Primarch. Instead, he proposed a plan whereby the forces remaining in the mountain were to barricade all entrances to the numerous caves and hold out until any nearby Loyalist forces could arrive. The Primarch himself was to take all the forces available to him and head to the planet in the conventional way. Gilliman agreed with the sensible arguments of Dantioch and immediately gave instructions for the preparation of the Legion's forces to advance. The only thing left was to coordinate his actions with the Imperial Regent. For this purpose, the enraged Avenging Sun burst into the chambers of Sanguinius. A tense conversation ensued between the two brothers. The first figure of action who was criticized was Lionel Johnson. Roboot Gilliman accused his brother of failing to fulfill his duties. The Primarch of the Thirteenth demanded that Sanguinius, as the Emperor, condemn the Lord of the Dark Angels and force him to account for his actions. Sanguinius refused to do so as a ruler and said he was ready to express complaints to the Lion only as a friend and brother. In addition, he rebuked Gilliman concerning his attitude towards the Imperium Secundus as his personal kingdom rather than a state created by three brothers. The phrase, My Empire, uttered by Gilliman several times unnoticed by himself, especially hurt the Primarch of the Ninth. Sanguinius also made it clear to his brother that he was greatly oppressed by all the artificiality and theatricality with which the Avenging Son tries to justify the creation of his state based on Ultramar. To all these accusations, Gilliman could only respond with apologies for trying to manipulate his brother and use him for his own purposes. Only after all the points were clarified did the Primarchs proceed to discuss the plan to defend Sota from the attack. Gilliman told Sanguinius that he had decided to go with his fleet personally to the defending world. Meanwhile, as his fleet moved to the planet, time would be bought by the defenders of the Pharos, as well as Captain Lucretius Corvo with her squad from the 90th Nova Company and a demi-company of the Dark Angels who were nearby. After a very short period of time, all the respective orders were distributed, and the plan for the defense of Sota began to come to life. The main actors in it were Barabbas D'Antioch and Alexis Pollock. They were required to strengthen the labyrinths of the pharaohs in the shortest possible terms. Pharos itself was an ideal stronghold for defence. Resembling a labyrinth crafted from mysterious dark stone of high durability, it connected several locations through its winding tunnels. There were three main locations. The primary communication chamber, named Primary Location Alpha, the secondary communication chamber, dubbed primary location beta, and located deep within 
primary location Ultra, where mysterious mechanisms, believed by Barabbas Dantioc to be energy generators for the entire machine, were placed. However, he could never fully decipher the principles of their operation. It was much later that Belisarius Call would realize that the device operated through shards of Catan trapped within its mechanisms and discover that the beacon itself belonged to the Necrons, aiding them in navigating space without entering the warp. Having reinforced the mountain, the defenders began preparing for the first battle, sincerely hoping they would be able to hold their positions without resorting to extreme measures of destroying the beacon. Moreover, the warsmith directed Ferros's beam towards the fleet of Captain Corvo, rushing to their aid. Thus, another ability of the beacon was revealed. Ships moving along the beam as if on a highway could exceed the speed of light. This was expected to help the fleet reach its destination faster. Captain Corvo hurried, sparing no engines as he understood that the defenders of Ferros had already engaged in unequal combat, and time was literally of the essence. Meanwhile, the remnants of the 199th, having retreated into the mountain, as well as a contingent of the Imperial Fists led by Polux, began to defend the entrances to the labyrinth. They were also assisted by two automata, which the Mechanicum had used for their research work on the beacon. All these modest forces, relying on fortifications and traps created by Polux, successfully defended, inflicting heavy losses on the enemy. This successful defence by the Loyalists would have continued, had the forces of the Warp not intervened. As it turned out, they too had their interests in this battle. It all started when a demon, having taken control over the body of his librarian, appeared to Gendor Skrevok and engaged in dialogue. The guests from the Imperium predicted to the Painted Count his death within the next four days, which would befall him by the command of Krukesh the Pale. He informed that the commander would decide to punish Skravok for failures in admonishing the others. The demon convinced the Night Lord that he had a single chance to save himself, and this chance was their cooperation. He promised the Space Marine that he would help him teleport into the very heart of the beacon, allowing him to seize it. For this, instead of punishment, the Master of Claws could receive a reward from his Lord. Of course, Gendor Skravok understood that a cunning entity like a warp demon would not offer its assistance selflessly. Thus he inquired about the price it would demand. In response, Skravok's interlocutor stated that in return he only asked for the destruction of the beacon as soon as circumstances required it. According to the demon, this ancient device was a terrifying weapon capable of harming the inhabitants of the warp. He also claimed that the former owners of the beacon had used it in antiquity, inflicting serious damage on chaos. Having no real choice and not seeing great danger in the suggestion of the warp spawn, the Master of the Claw gave his consent to ally with the demon. In turn, the demon immediately began to change the body of the librarian in which it was contained. Under the influence of the warp's forces, it turned into a magical sword that Gendor dared not even touch, instructing his servants to hide it. But this night brought an unexpected meeting not only to the master of the Night Lords. At the same time, the Emperor Regent entered the vast throne room, summoned there by what he thought was his guardsman as Kellen. But instead of his most trusted warrior, the Primarch found Conrad Kurz sitting on his throne, with the body of his genetic son lying at his feet. The brother had come to talk to the Lord of the Blood Angels, who was not particularly pleased with the visit. After exchanging a couple of threats with the Night Haunter, he immediately launched an attack, not even minding that he was without his armour. A swift duel ensued between them. A whirlwind of claws and swords swirled through the throne room. However, neither opponent could gain an advantage over the other. For both Primarchs possessed an unusual ability. They were tormented by visions of the future. Therefore, each predicted the other's actions. Having fought for some time and realizing that such a battle would lead nowhere, they parted ways. After this short skirmish, Kurz tried to start a conversation again and managed to bring Sanguinius onto a topic that seemed to have long concerned them both. It was about the event that was, in essence, their birth. Namely, about the incident in the laboratory that scattered the capsules containing the mighty children of the Emperor, 
across the galaxy. The Night Haunter claimed that it was not by chance, and that it was the father himself who chose such a torturous fate for him when he directed his path to Nostromo. The Primarch of the Ninth was almost entirely in agreement with his brother, but his opinion diverged in one fundamentally important aspect. He believed that their father indeed intentionally scattered the capsules across the galaxy and knew that the character of the legionnaires he created was akin in spirit to the populations of the Primarch's home planets. But the Angel was also convinced that the Emperor gave each of his sons a right to choose which side they could take. Voicing this opinion aloud, Sanguinius angered Kurz, and he ceased the conversation about it, for the brother refused to understand the depth of his suffering and resentment towards their father. Instead, the Lord of the Night told his interlocutor that he did not flee from the planet, as the Lion and Raboot mistakenly thought. He had always been within arm's reach, hiding in the Illyrian enclave. There, he discovered people who did not fit into the society of universal equality and prosperity created by Gilliman. They were aliens on this planet, both to the Primarch and to the rest of its inhabitants, and no one even tried to change anything in this situation. In this fact, he saw further proof of the world's injustice in which they had to live, and he tried to convey this point of view to his brother. But he remained deaf to Kurtz's arguments, and therefore the Primarch of the Eighth decided to end this futile conversation, especially since the warriors of the Sanguinary Guard were already breaking through the door. Kurtz understood that they would not let him go just like that, so he had already devised a way out for this case. He had long known that the statue of the father at the entrance to the throne room was filled with explosives and decided to use this to his advantage. Shielding himself with Ascalon, he slowly moved towards the window. Approaching the open gap in the wall, he dangled a space marine like a lifeless toy in one hand, threatening to throw it from a great height. After waiting a bit, he swiftly cut off the limb holding the sanguinary guardsman with a claw stroke, and he plummeted down like a stone. Before Sanguinius stood a tough choice, to let his beloved son crash or to catch the brother. He, like a caring father, couldn't resist his paternal feelings and dived down after Ascalon. Kurtzer thus activated the death trigger on the Space Marine's arm, causing a massive explosion that destroyed part of the throne room and vanished into the darkness. While the Blood Angels on Macrag were dealing with the aftermath of Conrad Kurtz's visit to the Imperial Regent, his son stood before Krukesh and explained how to penetrate the heart of the impregnable mountain. Claiming that his techno-adepts had uniquely adjusted the apparatus, he asserted that he could teleport the Atramenta Terminators directly into the mountain's main location at noon. Lord Chiroptera, though not trusting his subordinate, found his arguments reasonable, and he didn't have many other options for victory, and time was already running out. Krukesh the Pale decided to personally lead this attack on the Ferris, so, donning the Terminator armor, he entered the teleportarium. The demon kept its promise, and the teleportation occurred successfully at the appointed time. Although only about ten combat-capable Atramentars emerged in the main location Alpha, it was enough to start the Ferris's defenses crumbling. Lord Chiroptera immediately captured Barabas Dantioch and all the personnel assisting him in his work. This led to a malfunction in the Ferris, causing the fleet moving by its light, commanded by Lucretia Corvo, to almost be destroyed when it had to rapid decelerate from superluminal speeds due to the disappearance of the beacon. Though the ship suffered heavy damage, the Ultramarine decided not to abandon his plan and launched an attack. His fleet's ships, still moving at high speeds, were to attack the spacecraft of the Night Lords orbiting above. At this time, the Ultramarine's captain was supposed to have deployed the landing force on the planet. While his vessel was in such a vulnerable position, its protection was planned to be provided by the Dark Angels on their ship. Thanks to the element of surprise, the plan worked. One by one, the warships of the Eighth Legion began to light up in flames. Corvo was able to lead the landing on Sota, but for this to become possible, the Dark Angels had to sacrifice themselves, being destroyed by the fire of the Night Lord's ships while covering the Ultramarines. At the landing site, the Legionnaires of the 13th were already awaited by scouts. 
After the meeting, the defenders of the site immediately led their allies to the entrance of a cave, which allowed access to Ultra's main location, where the power installations of the beacon were located. Their demolition was a measure of last resort, but it was necessary should the beacon could not be held. Such was the order of Gilliman. The Loyalists understood that their landing had not gone unnoticed and that pursuit was already swiftly on their trail. Therefore, a handful of auxiliaries decided to win some time, giving the Astartes a chance to accomplish all that was required. They took up a defensive position over the entrance to the cave and engaged in an unequal fight with the Night Lords, who arrived soon after. Although success initially favoured Sergeant Merrick and his men, the resistance of the warriors was quickly broken. The surviving auxiliaries were taken prisoner. Since the cave they were defending had three entrances, it was crucial for the Night Lords to find out which one the Ultramarines had used. To this end, the Legionnaires subjected the captured prisoners to the most brutal tortures, and only after prolonged suffering did one of them give in and told all the information required by the Space Marines. Having quickly dealt with the remaining prisoners, they proceeded on the Ultramarines' trail. Those in turn had already reached their destination and began to mine the installation while simultaneously trying to take control of the situation inside the beacon. But it was too late. Krukesh, understanding nothing of the beacon's operation, found a way to Dantioc when he began to torture his best friend Alexis Pollux, captured shortly before. This broke the spirit of the Iron Warrior, and he reluctantly showed one of the Beacon's capabilities. At the command of Lord Chiroptera, he established a connection with the main square of Sertopolis, where the Night Lords had arranged a torture. Krukesh not only saw, but also seemed to feel what was happening, which struck him, and he wanted to use the Beacon for his purposes. The next order of the Night Lords captain was to locate Sevatar using the Beacon. The ancient installation easily accomplished this, delighting the warrior by showing him his much-despised commander, shackled in chains. Krukesh was so indulged in schadenfreude that he didn't notice how he approached the Night Lord's first captain and accidentally touched him. This made him realize that the beacon could be used not only for communication, but also as a means of transportation. Disregarding pleas to save Sevatar, who had arrived at the main location of the Skravok, Krukesh decided to act on his own. He was already relishing the thought of using the beacon to capture the flagship and unite the Legion's forces under his command. To this end, he ordered Barabbas Dantioc to find a path to the captain's bridge through the beacon. The warsmith pretended to obey his captor, but instead he planned to kill him and at the same time destroy the beacon so it would not fall into enemy hands. Having located the flagship, he began to increase the power of the energy generators, which caused a vortex to appear between the ship and the main location of the Alpha. In spite of the heaviness of the Terminator armor, it began to pull in Krukesh's warriors one by one. He himself was no exception and followed his Atramenta into the maelstrom of energy turbulence. The last to follow him was Gendor Skravok, who realized that he could not escape the mighty gravitational force. Obeying a hope for luck, he jumped into the centre of the vortex, after which it disappeared, and the beacon was deactivated, emitting a huge flash into space that spread across billions of light-years in space. Possibly, if the warsmith had known to whom he had thus signalled the existence of life in the Milky Way, he might have just handed the beacon over to the Masters of the Night. Now, noticing such a bright flash in the territories of the Imperium, was the living embodiment of hunger presented in the form of the gigantic Hive Tyrant fleet. But there were still several thousand years until their arrival. And for now, no one suspected such a great danger that would soon emerge from the void. Dantiac himself was not destined to face the consequences of his actions, as he received terrible injuries from the energy released by the beacon. He only had enough strength to say a few farewell words to his loyal friend Alexis Pollux, after which the heart of the Iron Warrior, who had become an example of an unyielding will and boundless devotion, ceased. The fate of those sucked into the vortex of the Night Lords was not so enviable. Some were scattered by the energy whirlwind in pieces, others were turned into formless masses, 
and only two managed to survive such displacement. They were Krukesh, the Pale, and Gendor Skravok. The former received severe injuries and lost his eyes. In addition to this, their armor burned during the displacement, and now immobilized the warriors with its weight. Of course, the appearance of the two captains on the captain's bridge raised many questions among the night lords present there, and already angered by Krukesh's speeches that they all now had to submit to him, the warriors of the Eighth Legion became even more enraged when they learned from the painted count that the master of the Chiroptera had the opportunity to save Sevatar, but had refused. This news was the last straw after which Krukesh was killed on the spot. Gendor was thrown into a cell for a while where he was to stay until it was decided what to do with him. By that time, deprived of the last unifying factor, the fear of Krukesh the Pale, the Astartes of the Eighth Legion began to scatter in all directions. Within hours, the detachment melted away like snow under a warm spring rain. For Rabut Gilliman, who arrived at the scene of the tragedy, there was nothing left but to finish off the remnants of the Night Lord's forces who had no chance of escaping the planet, and to assess the damage inflicted by their attack. Sothopolis and its surroundings were destroyed. The 199th Company was almost entirely wiped out, as was the squad of the Beacon Keepers, led by Alexis Polux. The Beacon, while still operational, had sustained serious damage, casting doubt on its ability to perform all its functions. The main specialist who could have repaired it had been killed. But the bad news for Gilliman did not end there. As soon as the beacon was activated and communication with McCrag was established, he received further news. Sanguinius informed the Avenging Sun that Conrad Kurz had not left his homeworld and had dared to appear for a conversation with the Primarch of the Blood Angels. Therefore, the Emperor Regent demanded the immediate return of the Lord Warden to McCrag which did not allow Gilliman to personally attend to the restoration of the Sotha. Sending one crisis after another, fate, knowing the real state of affairs in the galaxy, seemed to resist with all its might the implementation of Raboot Gilliman's plan, but for now, it seems, it still could not guide the lost Primarchs onto the true path. Especially in need of this was Lion L. Johnson, whose forces had already been scouring all 500 worlds of Ultramar for a long time in search of traces of Conrad Kurz. However, instead of them, he encountered the remnants of the forces of the Shadow Crusade scattered throughout the Empire of Sanguinius. This time, fate led him to the distant world of Zepeth. Assuming that his brother was hiding on this Chaos Devotee-captured planet, the Lion arrived to catch the elusive prey. But to the great disappointment of the Primarch, he found nothing there but ruins and a handful of traitors, consisting of word-bearers and world-eaters. Striking with full force and encountering little resistance, the Legionnaires of the First quickly broke the defense of the Chaos Adepts and liberated the nearly depopulated planet from the tyranny of Horus's followers. This insignificant victory, of course, could not please the Primarch of the Dark Angels for his main target on the planet was again absent. That is why he headed to one of the armory vaults, specially equipped for the storage of an artifact carefully hidden from prying eyes. This ancient device looked like a perfect sphere, on whose surface black with dark grey streaks crawled golden glints. A servitor was connected to this sphere. He was a boy who appeared ten Terran years old, though with wrinkled skin, yellowish cloudy eyes, bald patches in his hair, and sores at the corners of his mouth. Thanks to this puppet, the artifact was able to speak and announced its name, Tukulka. Turning to it again for help, the lion hoped to find traces of ships that had left the system Zepath before his arrival. But it, as if mocking the Primarch restraining his anger, refused to track the pursued enemy. It declared to the Lion that the Primarch would soon change his decision. This happened just a few minutes later. The Lion's assistant, Farith via Vox, was informed that the Cenotaph Beacon had gone dark. This message completely infuriated the Primarch, and he realized that all this time he had been searching in the wrong place. Although the Primarch didn't know that Conrad Kurz had not even attempted to cover his tracks and send Lionel Johnson on a false trail, he still took the event on Cenotaph as another cunning move by the Night Haunter. This led him to a mistaken conclusion 
followed by a correct decision. He ordered Tuchulcha to transfer his fleet to Macrag. This time, Lion L. Johnson's arrival at the capital world was not accompanied by the pomp and joy it had been the first time. Literally for a moment, the dropped shields let a single thunderhawk through to the surface. From it, after landing, stepped out the lone figure of the Lord of Caliban and headed to the waiting Gilliman on the landing pad. Following this moment, the lion learned the truth, which slapped him across the face harder than Curse's claws. Gilliman informed the Lord Protector that their brother, the Lord of the Eighth Legion, had not even left Macrag and had nearly killed Sanguinius. This was a bucket of cold water for Lionel Johnson, boiling with rage at Gilliman for not protecting the Pharaoh's beacon. Reaching the Emperor's chambers in almost complete silence, both Primarchs walked as if they were guilty children. Sanguinius awaited them. In the impending conversation, he decided to tell his brothers about the vision that had been haunting him for a long time. In it, he saw himself lying on the floor, fallen at the hand of Horus. Day after day, this scene reminded the angel of itself, giving him no peace. If at first the Primarch harboured hope in his soul that this was just one of the many possible outcomes, now, having seen the vision hundreds of times and having examined it in detail, Sanguinius understood that he would definitely not escape this fate. While he did not know where and how it would befall him, he was certain it would happen. This news greatly agitated Lionel Johnson and Raboot Gilliman, but he did not stay to hear their oaths and promises to protect him. Instead, turning the conversation back to the person of Kurz, he finally informed Lionel Johnson of the place where their lost brother was hiding, thereby narrowing the Lord Protector's search to a small area on Macrag called the Illyrian Enclave. Having received this important information, the Master of Caliban decided to go further and obtain not only carte blanche for conducting searches for curs in the specified area, but also, as he believed, to secure Macrag Chivitas. For this, he requested unlimited authority, which would allow him to declare martial law in the capital and total control. The first Primarch demanded the implementation of a curfew in the city streets, grant him unrestricted rights to surveillance, searches and investigations, and also authorize the detention of all ships approaching the planet in order to thoroughly check their contents. These demands became another cause of conflict with Gilliman, who opposed the violation of civil rights under any circumstances that would lead to such actions. However, all the argument was ended by Sanguinius, who satisfied the First Legion Primarch's request. This small victory for Lion even further widened the gap that had recently arisen between him and his brother Raboot. But this was of little concern to Lionel Johnson now. He immersed himself in the work of organizing the order maintenance measures that had been authorized by the Emperors, the Primarch understood that this brought him one step closer to achieving his desired goal, the capture of Conrad Kurz. For this, he not only increased security, but also transported his legion to the planet, disregarding Gilliman's protests. The latter even began to fear that perhaps the Master of Caliban, following some secretive schemes, decided to overthrow both brothers and become the sole ruler. But the measures taken by the Lion yielded results. Now it could be stated with certainty that Kurz was trapped in the Illyrian Enclave, and he had no possibility of escaping from there. This fact allowed Johnson to move on to the second part of his plan. He demanded the ability to clear the entire Enclave and comb it for traces of the hiding Night Lord. Only obtaining permission from the Emperor remained, for an invasion into this region could only worsen the already precarious situation. The entire history of Illyria screamed of the error in such a decision. It was a long-standing, festering wound of Macrag. Regions, scarred by impassable mountains and gorges, were divided among petty warring states that rejected all legality and order. In politics, they relied solely on the strength of their weapons. The Enclave had often been a source of problems. Nobles desiring to seize power on the planet frequently resorted to hiring mercenaries from this turbulent region. So it was during the attempt to overthrow the adoptive father of Conor Gilliman. It was indeed the Illyrians who were the mercenaries storming the Senate, where Conor Gilliman received a fatal injury, 
Only Gilliman himself could pacify this restless region, and he achieved this not so much with force and arms as with the respect he earned among the local rulers. Largely because of this, a fragile balance was maintained in the region. Now, however, the lion was ready to destroy it, needing only a pretext. And he did not have to wait long. Seizing upon a random attack on a communication node located in Illyria, the lion convinced his brothers of the necessity of a military operation, for which he already had a plan prepared. The first to enter Illyria were reconnaissance groups of the Dark Angels, accompanied by guides from the Ultramarines. Their task was to scout the terrain and identify key nodes of defence. The recon was to be followed by precision strikes, after which the First Legion would simply occupy the territory of the Enclave. However, the tactic was soon changed due to extremely high losses among the reconnaissance squads. The Lion's warriors were ambushed at every turn. The hand of the Night Haunter was felt in their organisation. This left no doubt about the reasons for the unrest in Illyria. After the failure of the first attempt to enter the region, the Lion decided to begin a full-scale invasion with the forces of his legion. Columns of vehicles with winged swords on their sides moved deep into the rebellious area. The initially rapid advance slowed down after just a few days of operation. Masterfully using the terrain conditions, winter weather and skills bestowed by Kurz, the locals actively destroyed the enemy's vehicles. For this reason, the forward units quickly ran out of supplies and were destroyed. The complete failure of the battles and the spillover of the conflict beyond the borders of Illyria forced Lionel Johnson to once again withdraw forces from the Enclave and retreat into a dense defence along its perimeter. In this way, he hoped to force the Lord of Nostramo into active actions, which should have drawn him out of the shadows at least for a short period. But waiting too did not bring the desired results. Time passed, and the effects of the measures taken by Lion L. Johnson were nearly invisible. Instead, the once peaceful citizens of Macraga Civitas themselves began to tire of the stringent restrictions imposed. More and more people started to take to the streets in protest, disregarding the Lion's ban on gathering in groups larger than five. Not knowing how to solve such problems, the Dark Angels resorted to the only method they knew – violence. They refused to understand that in such situations, any use of force would only provoke an equal and opposite reaction and would not solve the problem. However, passions were not only running high in the streets of the capital. The situation between the members of the Triumvirate was becoming increasingly tense. Unwilling to acknowledge his mistakes and failures and not mincing his words, Lion L. Johnson accused Robert Gilliman of weakness and indecisiveness. He once again brought up the history of the defiant Illyrian enclave to steer the conversation towards his new idea, which, as he believed, would definitively solve the problem of both the rebellious region and the rogue Primarch. This idea involved conducting a targeted orbital bombardment of the rebellious territories. The words of his brother were the last straw for the avenging son. Rage boiled within him like burning phosphate. The Primarch simply could not allow several million of his citizens to be annihilated just so that the lion did not have to admit his defeat. He vehemently began to protest against such a resolution of the problem, trying to first convey his arguments to Sanguinius, because he understood that the lion had already made his decision and would defend it to the end. The outcome of the dispute depended entirely on the emperor's decision, and Rabut was well aware of this. He also knew that if the Primarch of the Blood Angels sided with Lionel Johnson, the Lord of Ultramar would have no choice. For he was obliged in his position to fulfil the wishes of the Sovereign, not to determine them. But Johnson was required to do precisely the same. Therefore, in the dispute, the Lord of the Ultramarines decided to stand his ground, and in the conclusion of his fiery speech, said the following. If our Lord Emperor deigns to use battle starships against his own people, I will not partake in it. The Imperial Triumvirate will vanish, just like our moral right to lead five hundred worlds, not to mention building a new Imperium of Man. He understood that he was resorting to outright blackmail, and it was likely to end with him being declared a puppet master. But for himself, Gilliman decided 
that it would be better for his grand dream to crumble rather than to endure, hideously distorted. A burdening silence took over the hall. Both disputing Primarchs froze in anticipation of the Emperor's brother's decision. After a short pause, he delivered his verdict, according to which the Lion was forbidden to conduct orbital strikes on the rebellious region. Also, Sanguinius ordered at all costs to capture Conrad Kurz, after which the resolution of the issue with the rebel lands was to be handed over to Gilliman. The lost debate to the Ultramarine's Primarch, although another defeat for the Lion, still did not diminish his resolve to address the issue with Illyria through radical methods. Deprived of the possibility to attack from space, he ordered his ground units to hold back no longer and to conduct combat operations in the Enclave, without any regard for civilian casualties. Illyria blazed, turning into a massive funeral pyre, burning entire cities along with their inhabitants with its phosphex flame. The forested foothills, after being poured upon with tons of defoliants, turned into hundreds of square kilometres of rotten swamps. All those who somehow managed to escape from the war-torn land immediately ended up in huge concentration camps for displaced persons, where the dark angels subjected them to the severest scrutiny. Those who were even slightly suspected of aiding or even sympathising with the rebels were, by the lion's order, destroyed without any trial or investigation. Despite all these harsh measures, within a month, the First Legion managed to capture only two-thirds of the depopulated rebellious region. Moreover, both Lionel Johnson and his officers understood that the main fortresses, and consequently the main battles of this campaign, were still ahead. The road of war led the Lion's sons high into the impregnable mountains, and the first of them was the peak of Almamons, otherwise known as the Gatekeepers. It was a fortress, architectured by nature herself, moreover, the rebels actively worked on its fortification. Thus, before the Lion and his advisers arose a dilemma, without support from orbit, the battle for the mountain was fraught with huge losses, but direct violation of Sanguinius's order could lead to unexpected consequences, up to a direct military confrontation with Gilliman. The solution to this problem was offered by the commander of the Ravenwing, Farith Redloss. He found a way to circumvent the Emperor's ban on orbital bombardment by filling drop pods with phosphex and rad bombs. Thus, they could conduct an orbital bombardment, simply disguising it as a standard orbital drop. Of course, should such a plan be uncovered, the Lion would hardly be able to justify himself. But he liked the idea so much that he immediately gave his consent for such an attack. Just a few hours after the strike, the Master of the Dark Angels was climbing the slope, scorched by phosphex. Any other person not possessing the unique physiology of a Primarch would have received a lethal dose of radiation within the first few minutes on Alma Mons. According to Red Loss report, such a lethal level was supposed to be maintained for the next few hundred years. This did not worry the Lord of the First Legion in the least, as he could now resume the hunt and finally capture the prey that had been so annoying to him. Knowing his brother's love for theatrics and drama, Lion L. Johnson was confident that their meeting place would possess an atmosphere conducive to this. Soon, the Lion stumbled upon the ruins of a temple, which was to be the venue where hunter and prey would clash again in battle. Night fell, and Kurtz's appearance was not long in coming. Without uttering a single word of greeting, the Night Spectre immediately lunged at the brother who had come for his life. In an instant, a rapid fight ensued between them, the beauty and elegance of which a mere mortal would hardly be able to appreciate. He simply would not have been able to discern the rapid attacks of the opponents due to their inhuman speed. Here, agility and cunning met with strength and fury, but this time the Primarch of the Dark Angels did not rely solely on the power of his melee weapon. Skillfully dodging, he grabbed the bolter hanging on his belt and fired a deadly burst at his brother. For any other living being, this would have ended in death, but not for Kurzi. Deflecting some of the projectiles, he only sustained minor injuries. Realizing that the first attack on the enemy had failed, the Night Haunter once again plunged into the embrace of darkness. This time he decided to have a chat with his brother, to once again play with his composure. In his mocking speeches, Conrad tried to convince the Lion that he was as much a murderer as the Primarch of the Night Lords, and simply does not want to admit it to himself. 
Lion L. Johnson responded to his brother with cold phrases, causing Conrad, further inflamed, to unleash tirade after tirade. But Kurz would not be Kurz if he prattled just for the sake of it. All this was done to confuse the Lord of Caliban and prevent him from determining where the next attack would come from. However, Lion L. Johnson, having hunted the fallen Primarch for so long, had already thoroughly learned his tricks. He parried attack after attack, inflicting serious damage on the Night Haunter. But the latter still did not calm down, leading the first Primarch after him. And so, following another twisted plan of Conrad, they reached the climax of their battle, the crypt of an ancient pagan shrine. It was there that the Lord of the Night Lords had prepared the main trap for his brother. He'd mined the basement with melter bombs, which upon exploding were supposed to bury the last deceased in this crypt. But the would-be corpse had anticipated this possibility as well. His warriors had predicted such a move and had demined the crypt in advance. Conrad Kurtz's plan failed. In addition to this, it turned out that the usually trap-setting Primarch of the Eighth Legion had himself become the victim of a trap set by his opponent. Unfortunately for Conrad, the lion had not arrived at this location alone. This enraged Night Haunter, who, realising the hopelessness of his position in a fit of rage and anger, charged at Johnson, attempting to kill him before the latter could shackle Kurz in chains. After another swift bout, the lion managed to break the enemy both morally and physically. The point of culmination in this prolonged hunt was the breaking of the Primarch of the Eighth Legion's spine and his shattered claws. This finally deprived him of the ability to fight, which Lionel Johnson took advantage of. However, this time he decided to be extra cautious, binding his hated enemy in heavy chains. After a very short time, Kurz was brought before the Triumvirate's court. The Primarchs could not simply kill a brother. Otherwise, they would be no different from traitors to their father, such as Fulgrim, who killed Ferus Manus. They wanted to lend as much legality to the process as possible, for which they summoned many participants of the judicial process to the Legatine Collegium, who were to act both as witnesses and accusers in many criminal acts by Night Haunter. The process began with Sanguinius, who delivered the accusatory speech. Conrad Kurz, you stand before the Tribunal of the Imperium to answer for the crime and mayhem committed against the Imperium and its servants. A full list of charges will be announced later. For now, it suffices to say that you have waged war, as well as planned a series of murders and acts of terror. Hearing the charges against him, Conrad Kurz, in his manner, playfully turned the process into a verbal skirmish, drawing barbs at everyone within reach of his long tongue. However, his main target for these verbal attacks was still the Triumvirate, or more precisely, its unity. He was well aware of his enemy's weaknesses and did not hesitate to exploit them. Apparently, he was informed about the strained relations between Robert Gilliman and Lion L. Johnson. Therefore, he decided to strike them first. Kurz declared that the Lord of Caliban, with the tacit consent of the Avenging Sun, killed far more citizens of Macrag during the war in Illyrium than the Night Lord's own master. This public statement from the traitor's mouth was an unpleasant sting to Gilliman's pride, but he restrained his anger, although this was just a prelude before the main blow meant to shatter the strongest dam of emotions in the Lord of Ultramar. Conrad's calculation paid off. No sooner had he mentioned the events that took place on Alma Mons, indirectly hinting at Lionel Johnson cunning, which allowed him to bypass the prohibition on orbital bombardment, than a wave of righteous anger engulfed Ultramar. The lion literally saw how the bewilderment on the face of the Lord of Macrag turned into suffering, which quickly morphed into fury. Ignoring those around, the usually restrained Raboot publicly yelled at his brother, accusing him of lying and breaking promises. Addressing sometimes the Emperor and then his brother again, he hurled accusations, not even trying to stop. Meanwhile, the Night Haunter, smirking maliciously, continued to fuel the fire, injecting his comments one after another into the dialogue. Trying to silence the Primarch of the Eighth Legion, the lion approached him and raised his sword above his head. 
Only the furious gaze of the Sanguinius stopped the Lord of Caliban from killing his brother and froze with the sword raised over Kurz's head. This hesitation was seized by the jeering son, who sprang from his place. He snatched the sword from his brother's hand and with the next movement broke it over his knee, then threw the words directly into his brother's eyes. A sword in atonement for the oath. That's the worth of your honor, Knight of Caliban. Throwing the fragments of the sword at the owner's feet, the avenging son walked around the disgraced Primarch and taking Kurz with him, departed. In this way, the lion's rash actions destroyed the triumvirate and with it, Gilliman's dreams of a new just state for humanity. Who knows how the fate of the three Primarchs and the entire human race could have unfolded if Johnson had kept his word. Perhaps it could even have saved Sanguinius's life, but, most likely, it would have left not a single chance for the true ruler of humanity and his empire. Yet events unfolded as they should, for thanks to the same lion, during the conversation with Kurz, Sanguinius went to terror and made his great sacrifice, and the lion and Gilliman made their significant contribution to the final defeat of the traitors and the further organization of life in the post-war Imperium. Although the descendants of the Triumvirate carried the memory of these great deeds through the millennia, they preferred to forget about the accomplishment that became, perhaps as deep a disappointment as it initially seemed a great hope. An accomplishment that turned the majestic Imperium Secundus into an empire shamefully forgotten. For a long time, Gilliman was the only living person in the 42nd millennium who kept memories of the Forgotten Empire. Only after the awakening of the Lion was there a second person capable of telling the world about those ancient events. However, there's a possibility that he has his point of view on what happened, which may greatly differ from that of the Avenging Sun. Therefore, until the meeting of the two brothers, it remains a mystery how their past conflict will affect their current relationship. Moreover, with the recent events unfolding during the Plague Wars on Macrag, this topic might resurface even without the will of the resurrected Primarchs. A Nurgle demon revealed a veil of ancient mystery to historiator Fabian Gulfrain, leading him to yet another silent witness of those events. He literally handed him an ancient tome entitled The History of Emperor Sanguinius's Reign. From that moment, Gulfrain became the very patient Zero in whom a new plague was born, a plague of a completely different kind, the plague of doubt, a disease far more infectious if it finds a suitable carrier, and who could be a better candidate for this role than a person with the rank of the historiator Fabian Gulfrain? It's hard to speculate how descendants will judge the actions of three brothers who doubted the might of their father and posthumously buried him. Will they believe that in the actions of the Primarchs there was no selfishness and personal ambition? After all, in the years following the Horus heresy, many of the Emperor's loyal servants were punished for far less. The enemies of the Avenging Son, who previously had nothing to reproach him with, will especially rejoice. By smearing his bright image with their dirty insinuations, they might well suffocate the budding sprouts of hope for a bright future. All that remains is to wait and hope that humanity will overcome this new disease, just as it overcame the plague of Nurgle.